let's have a bit of fun. I'm gonna, it's, uh, those people who are outside are gonna miss the comedy show at the start. Yeah, this is more comedy, more comedy. Another security failure. Does anyone know, does anyone know what actually Java stands for? Just another vulnerability actually. And we are, and because I'm an equal opportunity take the piss artist, another security failure. So, we are going to show the hack of the century. This is actually how I understand uh, Hollywood knows about hacking. And if I can find it and we'll work. That's, uh, if you've not seen this, this is absolutely amazing. Um, let's hope stuff works. Yes. Okay. Where are we at? Hello. Uh -huh. Hello. There. This might work. I don't know. I haven't tested it yet. Hello. This. I hope this works because this is freaking hilarious. Oh God. Come on. Play. All right, hang on a second. I'll try it on this side and see what happens. It might be me breaking the internet. Um, I would like to point out to a lot of people here. You're in this room. Would you check? I'll tell you later. Um, okay, sorry, I've got the hack of the century, I hope. And is it playing? It doesn't seem to want to play on this. If you haven't seen this, go see this. Uh, let's see if this works. Play, pause, play. Eh, it's no biggie. It's not working. Try IE. Try IE. Yeah. <laughs> well, there's always one, isn't there? Try IE. <laughs> and for my next thing, I'll drop my pants for you. <laughs> Have I still restarted my computer? Have you tried turning it on and off again? I, yes. <laughs> Three times. Oh, this is gonna be a fun audience. Wait till I see how I'm gonna screw you guys. <laughs> okay, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to Defensive Programming 101. 101. 101. That's it. Uh, let me just make sure this is not playing because it'll have some really fun things in the background. Okay. My name is Niall Merrigan, and I am the head of custom software development with Capgemini in Stavanger in Norway. Um, if you are using Twitter, there is uh, Dev Day, I think is, there might be even ABB Dev Day. AB, ABB Dev Day, sorry, typo thing going on there. And you can tweet me at Ed Merrigan. As I said, I'm Irish. <laughs> you can watch the slow kind of like, the guy, they're watching the presenter and then it slowly goes up and there's a joke in there. <laughs> yes, I'm Irish, I live in Norway, um, which uh, believe it or not, I like tanks. And this, is an actual picture from Norway. The, that is a photo box, as in a speed camera. Things that Polish people have never seen because you're driving too fast. <laughs> I sat in the back of a BMW 1 Series with Rafa in the front and some other person, and I feared for my life because I was trying to figure out did the seatbelt actually go over my shoulder? Because the speed dial went beyond what I'd ever seen any car should do, except on Top Gear, All right? So ladies and gentlemen, I'm going to start. The, I, this is normally, a, as Paul Stack uh, pointed out, a 90 minute talk going to be condensed into 50 minutes or less. So I talk a little bit fast for Irish people. <laughs> for Polish people, I'm not too sure how fast I'm going to talk. Um, if, I'm talk hello, if I'm talking too fast, will you do the international signal of slow the hell down? <laughs> OK. Yeah, there's one guy already going, huh? <laughs> Wake up, come with the program, come on. Okay, we're first gonna talk about developers and why they don't write secure code. Why don't developers write secure code? Not enough time. Not enough time. Ooh, good answer. Anyone else? Excuse me? Never think about it. Another one, and it's boring. Lack of knowledge. Oh, there we go, there's the consultant in the room. Customers don't wanna pay for it. A <laughs> oh, man after my own heart. We should have a chat later. <laughs> yes, all of the above, actually. But, um, a lot of it comes down to we don't think about it. Security is an afterthought. Um, if, we, even if we look at human history, security is always an afterthought. Think, I'm, gonna talk in, I'm not going to talk in his, uh, real historical terms, but I'm talking in, for example, near history. 1972, 
You could get on a plane with a shotgun in your hand luggage, no problem. 1974, they brought in um, electron detectors because someone actually decided to use the shotgun to hijack an airplane. 1975, 1976, it started getting worse and worse. In 1980, 19, or 2004, I came up to Norway the first time and I had four and a half liters of alcohol in my hand luggage. <laughs> I didn't realize I was smuggling and I thought it was an EU country, so it was okay, but it's not. So, um, but that was no problem. Now I can't take a bottle, uh, 100 mils because security is reactive. People, someone will ask, why are you doing that? And my usual answer is, because you didn't say I couldn't. Yes, it might be unethical, but security is all about defending against attacks. And people will, once you say, this is how I'm gonna defend, they'll go, so that I don't need to worry about that, I'll go around it. And that's, where, that's how security evasion works. Security comes up and says, we want to do this. We'll go, fine, we'll just change, we'll do something else. Job done. Now, as we continue to worry about, or not to worry about security, more and more people are getting screwed. Okay, 95% of developers are trusting. We build code, it's our beautiful little baby, why would I want to break it? It's mine, look what I created, I am God. <laughs> The machine bends to my will. <laughs> Sorry, I think that should be the entrance exam to every programmer. Do you want to make, the, actually, and that's what iPhone 6 has apparently done, bend it to your will. <laughs> <laughs> See, they just made everyone a programmer. Nice. Um, I can just sit on my ass and bend my phone. Um, so, we, the other 5%, if you're wondering where they are, they're turning to be management, because they're just not good developers. Um, security people, are nat not, we're not natively security conscious, as we say, because we trust a lot of stuff. And because we write code for these nice people, like this is our general user base, you know? <laughs> They're so happy with my UI. <laughs> is that what I paid for? So that's why we write code. They, they are the type of people that if I said go A, B, C, they will go A, B, C. And they won't even question why there's a B. They just work it, no problem. And then we talk about our kind of like curious people, hackers, crackers, uh, people with Macs and balaclavas and stuff like that. Um, generally, I, ex I expect everyone in this room to be in that kind of category. You're curious about what you're doing. You're curious because you're sitting here trying to figure out why I should write better code. But you're also that person who will say, I wonder what will happen if I do something different. You'll look for shortcuts in your code. You'll look for shortcuts in your day-to-day in your -day, uh, computing lives. How many of you kind of would be happy enough if I took away the mouse off your keyboard, or uh, sorry, off your computer, and would go, no difference, I can work. Does anyone not do that? I'm okay. You're okay. Do you want a hug? <laughs> <laughs> so we have to kind of go off and fix our developers. And we have to educate them. That's generally where I kind of say that we have to, what we have to do. We have to look at our development teams and say, right, you are doing something very, very stupid. Do you understand the consequences of this? And the general kind of thing will be, no, I do not. Because they don't, they don't see it. It's, I'll give you another example. I, I like using examples for uh, my talks. It's, it's more fun as having a bit of stories. I tried to rent two cars down in Spain. And I rang up the, I booked the two cars online. And I then rang the, uh, emailed the company and said, I would like my brother to be able to, c to c collect my car before me because he's arriving in six hours earlier from Ireland. And they said, sure, he can do that, but you need to send us by email your credit card number, your, um, your address, your date of birth, and the CCV number. <laughs> now, general question to all the room, how many of you would do that? Speak to me later, you know what's going on in the next. And I, I, I ring the person up and I say, are you serious? And I didn't use the word serious, I used something else um, in a very Irish term. We are, we're recording this, right? Yes, nice, good. So can you, can you beep out stuff? <laughs> what's a swear in Polish? What's a swear in Polish? I'd like, yeah. uh, you can all swear, I don't. I just, as long as I don't do it, it's fine. <laughs> <laughs> Ta-da! <laughs> it's, yeah, that's fine, we're good. Oh, you're gonna beef himself, oh, that's fine, even better. We're good, you can smile. <laughs> we, go again. <laughs> I don't trust you to tell me what that gets at. <laughs> you're gonna be saying, you know, something a bit foreign, you know. There's a whole lot of people going, you did, you said what? 
is the password. <laughs> I, as I'll tell you another story about that one. Um, so I, I ring this person and say, listen, I can send this. I cannot in good conscience send you a copy of my credit card details by email because email is not secure. And there was the kind of dumb silence in the background of like, huh? Email is not secure? I'm like, no. And they go, but people send it every day. We do this every day. And I said, that doesn't make it right. And my mother then goes, fine, I'll send, it. I'll send my credit card. <laughs> I will tell you, the amount of data leakage out there is insane. And the world is a very, very scary place. You know, you open up and it's just, <laughs> you know, it's just terrifying. Because we've got zombie clowns. We've got zombies everywhere. Um, when we think about the web, we, th we, th we think it's nice and fuzzy. But, you know, the web is a very terrible place at times. It's a, it, it's, it, it brings out the best in human abilities and brings out the worst. And it also, as we see, we have things like this, like the Heartbleed bug. And Heartbleed, if you've not heard of it, and I wish you, I hope you all have, Heartbleed was a very, very simple thing. What it did was this. It's topical because it still it's, it leads on to my next one. Heartbleed was, I want to tell a server I'm still here, so I'm going to send out a message and you reply back. And everyone went, that's cool. How are you going to do that? I'm going to send a message and send back the same one. But then, what you could do with Heartbleed was you could say, send me back the same message, but give me the next 64K of data that you have. And what that happened then was it brought out stuff that was normally cryptographically secure and then just sent it back to you. So you then got information that you shouldn't have had and could start breaking it. Very, very simple. It was a very, very quick bug. And, it, and just it, because of the fact that it was sitting in OpenSSL, which is used by so many people right now, it means that we were like going, oh, bugger. And they thought this was the bad thing. And then we got this. Now, there's a couple of people who are probably trying to figure out where the reference for this comes from, OK? Not that I'm fucking McDaniel, or Pooh or whatever it's called. Um, but it's Bash, Born Again Shell. OK, Born Again, Jason Bourne, and, and uh, Matt Damon. <laughs> I hate when I have to explain jokes. That means I didn't get it. Born, the Bash shell, or what was known as Shell Shock. What this is, is it allows it to run arbitrary code against the Bash shell. Now, if we craft a header to, an to a web application that's running with Bash in the background, basically Apache or any frickin' Red Hat or whatever you want to talk, this will run an arbitrary command. Now, people are going, that's not too bad, I suppose. But it doesn't require any admin logins, root, whatever. It just works. It just sends commands and works. Now, if we think about this in a little bit differently, imagine being able to just inject into a config file your own admin username and password, or change that it doesn't run HTTPS anymore. Just so subtle things. And not enough that it will just uh, break the application in a bad way, or just maybe disrupt it, or even worse, you're just going to say, let's just make it easier for me to hack this. Or else just say, OK, let me find all vulnerable servers. There's a guy running a script, and what he's done is he's just said, OK, ping a whole lot of a uh, send a whole lot of a, uh, uh, headers to different web servers. And inside that is like header cookie, header this, and it just has the actual command for to run a ping command back to him. So he then has another machine waiting, which just is listing all the pings that he's getting. So he knows all the machines that are compromised. He's now detailing where he can go to attack, or if he wants to, or who, who should fix stuff. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to go through about a number of different uh, technical topics. I'm going to count them down. I have done this talk since 2008. Variations of this talk since 2008. In the, no in the amount of years I've done this, not one person has come back with zero errors. This is a large room. I'm kind of worried that we might actually get a zero in this. Um, if you get four or five, don't worry, that's normal. If you get 10, come talk to me. I've got good consulting rates. And, or, or my colleague just down here I'm going to employ later. Um, if you get zero, you will be the first person in eight years to do it. Seven years, six, six years, maybe. So whatever, I can't count. But for overflow. And if you're, uh, please, be, uh, you can't do this if you're in management and not a programmer, because then they're just cheating. Um, so let's look at all these different things. Number 10, this is like an OWASP top 10 kind of idea. And this is admin, in, in, admin info on the web server, or leaving admin win info in such a way that it actually makes it easier for your client to attack you. Okay. Now, let's talk web developers. Anyone web developer in the house? OK, quite a good people. People playing the home game, it's a lot of people playing web developer. How many of you deploy and press 
deploy and just push and it works. How many use like FTP? Or upload zip files or, you know, man manually go in? Yeah, a lot of us do. A lot of us have still done it. How many of you have, for example, taken a copy of the existing site, zipped it up, put it in a backup, and then copied in the new files? Done it. That's a problem, because you can go looking for these files. Um, if you go to like, uh, like ftpsearch.co, or Google, or uh, search napalm FT, uh, ftps.org, you can go looking for open FTP sites, and we can do this now, actually. We will have a little bit of fun. Um, let's see, where are I at? Twitter, no, I don't want to do that. Let's do this. Okay. And file type in URL, this one. Let's see if the internet's working. If it's not, it's going to be interesting. Okay, we'll let that load, I hope. Hello? Internet? I'm not pineappling myself. Anyway, the internet just does not seem to want to work. You're all breaking the internet. Stop downloading stuff. Okay, we're not getting that one. All right. Whoa, did we get something? <laughs> yeah, hang on, hang on, wait for it. Yay! What did I just search for? Who's, who's a .NET developer the, and a web developer at the same time? Okay, tell me what I just, what I just did. Yeah. What does the web config do? Go, yeah, we're good, we're getting better here. What, what can you not do with the web config? Make it public. Make it public. You know, that's another thing. You can't download it over IIS. It won't, run over, it won't download over HTTP, but it will download over FTP. Now, if you look at this, you're kind of going to have a look for a whole lot of web configs. And this is, just, this is just a random search. Like, you can do this like, for other type of files. If you go looking for likes of uh, mobile sync, uh, mobile sync is the uh, Apple uh, backup directory. Okay, and if you go for manifest.plist, manifest.plist um, inside mobile sync will, should bring you, find you iPhone backups. <coughs> now you can download an iPhone backup and then decrypt it. Now I don't know about you, but there's a lot of people who uh, carry a lot of personal information on their phone. And there's a lot of information leakage there and they leave them public. Um, you used to be able to search uh, for Visa card numbers this way. Um, just go looking for open Visa card numbers, but now if you do that, it'll tell you your, your computer's doing something suspicious. <laughs> no shit. Uh, <laughs> I'm searching for Visa card numbers. I'm, I'm looking to help grandma. <laughs> this type of information, leaving this open, screws you. Leaving headers, leaving like trace.axt, leaving elma.axt, leaving glimpse.axt open that you can actually tear the inside of an application apart without having to do any work. This is kind of, this is where they said, right, have you seen the kind of idea? Facebook, I'm going on holidays, can't wait, left the front door open, best of luck. <laughs> okay, don't make it hard. Yeah, this is, defen that is what I'm saying about defensive. It's not all about programming, it's also looking at the environment you have. So this is security by obscurity. You notice there's no, they've actually got no seat. Okay, so we can Google all this type of information. This is the hipster guy. He's got a Nintendo belt buckle as well. Um, this type of information being leaked onto the internet or uh, by your application is very, very serious. It's very, very simple to do. It's very easy to overlook. Step one, check that. There's probably a couple of people kind of now frantically going back and checking what they're doing, whether this type of information is open. If we look at number nine, let's see where I am. Uh -huh. Where am I here? This one. What's your password? What is your password? Password123. Password123, cool. That's actually, believe it or not, one of the top passwords in the world. How, let, let's do a quick survey. How many of you do use Hotmail, Gmail, Googles, any of these type of applications, Facebook, Gizmodo, I don't mind. Anyway, everyone use the internet? Good. Everyone use the internet for good? Good. How many of you use the same username and password for all these services? Hands up, please be honest. Just, I just, I'm looking to see. There's one person being honest, two, three. All the rest are secure? You use KeePass? That's good. Well, good start. The amount of people who don't is very high. Now, if I was to tell you that it's very hard to hack Google's passwords and Facebook passwords, you'd probably go, that's fine. But if I told you it's very easy to hack other places, and find these applications and, are, and go for username and passwords, 
you'd say, okay, but what's the problem? I said, well, all I have to do is find one combination and then I can go looking and see all the different parts that they're going to use that type of password in somewhere else. Because if they're using a human readable password, it means most likely that they are actually looking at stuff and going, ah, I'll just use the same password or variation of. Now, using the FTP trick again, go look for password.xls or xlsx or text. <laughs> I kid you not, you will find quite a lot of information there. It's ridiculous, it's very, very simple, but it's, this is the problem. So if we think of passwords like underwear, okay? Don't leave them out where people can see them, so no passwords.xls. You should change them regularly. <laughs> There's one guy going, Mom didn't say to do that. <laughs> and you shouldn't loan them to strangers. Okay. It's, it's, it sounds stupid, but it is very obvious. The amount of people who don't encrypt, or sorry, hash passwords. I'm going to tell you something. Does everyone know the difference between encrypt and hash? Yes, you do? Everyone not, so the general kind of consensus is not everyone gets it, what encrypt versus hash is. Encrypt means reversible. Hash is not. Hash is one way, usually. It means I will create a variation of your password using mad numbers and I'll store it as that. But it means that if, I, if you try and uh, reverse engineer that, you won't be able to get it. So far, so good. Dec encrypt means I can decrypt it. It means I can reverse that. Uh, Concept. So all passwords should be hashed. All it takes is you to do is use cross-pollination. Someone to get with a weak um, uh, security cipher or security uh, protocol, and all of a sudden I've got a username and password which I can then use to get onto somewhere else. So if you don't be the weak link in the chain, how many of you are actually doing that? How many of you are hashing passwords if you're storing to password credentials? For all the rest of you, can you please go look at it? Bcrypt. No problem, you just let it run. If you're using um, the default password provider in ASP.NET, it was running SHA-1, that's bad, 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 bad. Um, download P uh, bcrypt, which will run it in like uh, 2048 or 4096 encryption uh, uh, level strength, and it's much better. So, like, we're gonna get to the point, you know, you're gonna have to name your dog, you know, uh, with a letter and a number and an exclamation mark, you know, for what's your kid's name, et cetera. But it is, passwords are very, very uh, simple, and they're still a, a very weak point in any application. Password security, people, developers don't, don't care. Store my password, it's fine. We just don't do it. Number eight brings me back to Heartbleed, Shellshock, patching. How many of you know what you're actually running on? You do, because you're DevOps, that's different. Um, like for example, if I, do you know the version number of your server? Do you know the actual um, uh, IIS versions? Do you know the HTTP versions? Do you know if bash is patched? Do you know anything is patched? Do you care? As developers, we don't. We've got to the point where it used to be, I, knew, I had to know what even the, where the box was. Now I don't care, it's in the cloud, I don't give a shit. Just run it off, I don't care. We hope it's gonna be patched. So we have what is known as, what happens the second Tuesday of every month in Microsoft world? Past Tuesday. Past Tuesday. What happens the second Wednesday of every month? Wednesday. No, rollback Wednesday. <laughs> <laughs> it broke something, Blink. or, Let's talk about it a different way. If I showed you I am patching a security hole, and I showed you the patch, and I said, this, this, this patch is a vulnerability, great. And you, rever you reverse engineer the patch to see what it's actually fixing. What does that tell you? Yeah, it tells you what they were actually trying to fix. So it gives you an insight into what's actually where you should try your next attack vector. It also tells you the, um, where, if they're not applying the patches, where I should be actually doing my attack. I, I'm, my, my job here is mainly to kind of sh show you the way that bad people or devious people or people with a little bit too much time in their hands think. Okay? We are very trusting of how application patches roll out, but by reverse engineering a patch, I can see what they were trying to fix and then try and write the exploit for it. Okay, that's what they're trying to do with this type of video. It is very, you, you have to try and work with your sysadmins. I know you don't like them, but just please be nice to them every so often and ask them to patch the servers for you. It never, you know, that way. We're gonna talk a little bit about authentication and uh, validation. Sorry, validation really. H have you turned off your application? Has anyone browsed the web without JavaScript lately? Have you found it a very thrilling experience? 
Answers, no. It's crap. Everything breaks, nothing works. If you turn off JavaScript, nothing works. It is the ubiquitous language of the web. It is the assembler of the web now. If you turn it off, nothing works. All of us as developers probably do JavaScript checks to verify that the, that the data inputs we're getting um, to the, before we hit the server are being done. But if I turn off JavaScript, I can actually just, I can probably bypass certain commands and get it to just forcibly take the um, inputs I want. Okay? Work with me on this. But if I don't check on the server before it hits my database, all of a sudden my JavaScript is not, it, all the front end stuff is just, it, it should be just eye candy. The front, it should, all the front end shove should tell you is, you made a mistake, can you fix this? You made a mistake. But before it hits my database or it's stored in the data layer, it should be validated by the server straight away. It is two fa the, way, the simple way is we're looking at a two-pass uh, uh, validation. You should validate all the inputs on your server even if your client is validated. Because I can send valid input, but it might actually be uh, me doing something funky. You should use a, validation, a central validation source. If tomorrow they decide how email is going to be changed, how the whole email address system is going to be working, there's a lot of people who've got to write a load of new client scripts to validate that. Whereas if you just have a central source, I can just change it. But it also means if you find a bug, a centralized source, I just change in one place and it works everywhere else. You need, okay, pop quiz. Blacklists or whitelists? Both, no. <laughs> nice try though, good choice. Um, black. Yeah, why would you use a blacklist or a whitelist? Whitelist because it's more secure. Why? Give that man a round of applause, please. Thank you. You are correct. Normally, most people say blacklists because they say, I want to tell you what I don't want. But the problem is that is a very wide net. Whereas if I just say, this is all I want, Use that, that's fine. That I can control. That's a much smaller piece of information. Blacklists are much wider. So the problem there is that we should always use whitelists. Tell it what I actually want it to have. Do you, for example, put, have you seen like Hotmail? Hotmail has a very weird, and Microsoft accounts in general, have a very weird limitation. You can only have 16 characters in the password. No, it's, 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 it's a physical limitation on, on because of uh, the fact that it was designed a lot longer ago um, than a lot of the new applications stuff. So the idea is they can still, they say you have to have a minimum of eight to 16 characters. The maximum is 16. They won't let you have any more than that. Probably enforced by the NSA. <laughs> Never thought of it like that, but you could be right. <laughs> But that is another thing. These are the, the, the validation there is like you have to use 16. You should escape special characters, validate against RFC rules, and validate XML against the schema. How am I doing on time? How much time have I got? Half hour? 20 minutes? 20 minutes. Oh, bugger. <laughs> OK. We're going to take the piss out of the Swedes. Error message in production. <laughs> I was very surprised to see this. I thought that you had to put your own error message together. <laughs> But this is very common. People put out error messages and uh, don't give a crap. I found one on the Irish Examiner website. It's a very popular website in Ireland. And it showed me it was written in vb.net. It was showing me they were using data sets and I could see where they were making mistakes. I emailed the webmaster and he was like, huh? So this, this may look like gobbledygook to a general populace. But to programmers, this tells you a hell of a lot of information. You start reading it and you go, oh, so that's what they're doing. Oh, I wonder what they're doing. Don't do this. If you're using uh, uh, ASP.NET, make sure that your um, remote uh, errors are set to on by default. Okay, use like, uh, just make sure that if on local servers it'll work fine, but on when it goes out it'll be automatically done. Permission sets. What's happening about your permission? Have you, how many of you use database connection strings? Cool, so we're still awake, that's good. <laughs> How many of you have actually set them up with um, just read-only connection for, like I'm gonna ask a question. You're doing a search system. You're just writing search. Do you have read and write on your connection string on your user policy for that? And if you have write, why do you have write? For doing search. And it's just a question I'm gonna pose to you because it starts off with permissions. The idea is, you should always just get permissions at the lowest level and build them up to what you need. Never go the other way down. Never start with God and, and reduce back. 
Because the problem is it is much easier to give than it to take away. With permission sets, if you're doing for the likes of, we're going to go to a database, we're going to do a search, but I've given read and write access as well, it means I'm going to leave myself up to injection attacks because that person now can do other things. If they can just do read, read is generally going to be okay, but if they can't write, so the, I, this is where I'm going to say, I, how many of you have seen, like, for example, SA permission sets on connection strings? How many of you have seen them in production? Does anyone know what the um, ASP.NET account system account is? Anyone know what it is? Yeah? It's a use the ro just straight um, ASP.NET uh, worker process account. I found one running in an, in an application running as enterprise admin. Now, I'm going to explain this in simple terms. Enterprise admin is God and his father. <laughs> it is everything. It is the superhuman account, and it was a headless turtle running around with it that we could decrypt. Now, hang on a second. Paul, remember we were talking about the police and uh, what's illegal in Poland? <laughs> um, if you ha like, if you go to IIS, inside an IIS, you have a very simple thing. It's called a metabase. And the metabase tells you a lot about how IIS is configured. And if you have IIS 6, or you install IIS 6, 6 compatibility, you've got two properties in there called I, IWAM user and IWAM password. So since they were actually this, they are the plain text versions of the username and password that are running the application pools. So yeah, I, I know it's it, this is the type of kind of scenarios I'm showing you that the, this information exists in plain text because someone says, well, it'd be handy to install um, a um, metabase compatibility. We we kind of we may need it, but we actually don't. But this type of permission means that all of a sudden I can start looking at more stuff. I can then, if I, can start, if I have an account that's running too highly privileged, if I hijack that, I can start doing more and more damage. We're going to go on and do a little bit about what is known as directory traversal. And directory traversal is whereby I'm going to go into an application and then by using crafted commands, go back and up and down through the directories and find stuff. Ever done this? Ever seen this? Much more common in PHP and ASP. The idea, for example, if I use uh, file download uh, dot ASPX and question mark file name equals file dot, p file dot text, I'm telling it where to go find the file dot text, correct? Now, if you use dot dot forward slash dot dot forward slash web dot config, I can actually force it to download the web dot config for me, for example. Or I can just pass in, if I just tell it what file I wanted to pass down, it will pass it down to me. Directory traversal allows me to go back up and down through the application and using dot dot or whatever. Now, if I'm running with very bad permission sets, I can go off and download SAM or security. Anyone know what these are? Ever seen off crack, etc.? So this idea is if I change the download variable to point to somewhere else, I can actually do mad things. Now, I am running at a little bit. Okay. Ladies and gentlemen, we're going to have a bit of fun today because I'm going to change things a little bit. <coughs> Because, let's see if this is working. For those of you using the internet right now, yes? Would you mind, please, looking at your phone or MacBook or Pro and verifying that you are actually connected to the correct network? Because these are the people that are currently connected to me. Now, looks fun, but what am I doing right now? You don't know. I am currently sitting as a man in the middle between you and the internet. Okay, so far so good. Okay, I am also running a thing called SSL Split. SSL Split allows me to take your SSL um, request split out the SSL, submit it as HTTP, get the return back of HTTP, and then send it back to you in SSL, and you're none the wiser. Now, I'm telling you this because the amount of people that are connected to DevDay, which was the API set up, even though, if I look here nicely, it tells you it's not a DevDay on this. People will sell their soul for free Wi-Fi. <laughs> Human rights will be defined as you will have air, water, and free Wi-Fi. <laughs> now, we are looking at this. 
And what am I doing? I'm actually just, all I'm doing is I'm running a thing called, it's this little box right here with this really strong antenna. <laughs> I'm broadcasting heavier than everyone else, so I'm basically irradiating myself up here. I'm going to have a lot of fun later. <laughs> okay, what we're doing, we're going to demonstrate a man in the middle attack. Can I get two volunteers, please? Two people just to come up. Gentlemen, here, come on, come on, hop, hop. Good, good, good. Hi, can I get a mic as well? I might need to talk to these people. Okay, this is how a man in the middle attack works. Write down your username and password, please. I mean, no, not your real one. Well, actually, if you want. <laughs> Can you stand over there? Sure. Good. This is fun. I like <laughs> dogs who... I like dogs, okay? <laughs> It, this is not a, a test, it's very simple. You don't have to write us an essay. Cool. Okay, thank you. Okay. Dun, 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 dun. Here you go. Great. Now that's his login. Is that okay? Yeah, it looks fine. Great, thanks. Here you go. Okay. I, just, um, I have now just taken his details. He doesn't know any different. I'm like, sweet. I can now go log in as him. This is how the, um, thanks gentlemen, what's your name? What I, and yours? Okay, can I get a round of applause for our, our, like, our very nice people? Thank you very much. Sorry, thank you. Very simple. This is, a, this is an example of a man in the middle attack. I just took their information and just swapped and they didn't know. Now, visibly, it's very simple when you see it right now. However, if you don't know where your application, like how many of you know where even your, when you send, you press submit where it goes? It goes into the ether, something says, yay, and it sends me back information. I don't care. The idea is very simple, and this, and like, this is really evil. Like, the, if I sh try and, I'm gonna, tr actually, um, let's see if this will work. We are going to go completely off script here. <sighs> okay, so, that, you can all still see that. Okay, so we have a lot of people connected here right now. There's a lot of people. <laughs> oh, boy. Okay, someone's on the surface, nice. Um, so SSL split, it's Entropy Bunny. It's not running at the moment, but if I start it, it'll probably just screw, screw you all. Um, we'll start uh, getting all the information going back and forth over the network and just uh, connect it out. I can run a thing here called DNS spoof. And what DNS spoof does, very simply, is this. It says, when you get a request for www.devday.pl, for example, redirect to my web server. Okay, fine. You don't care, you type in devday.pl, I show you a relatively good server. Fine, it works. Now. How many of you are staying at like uh, the Holiday Inn or any place like that? I am. How many of you have ever stayed at a, 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 a hotel where the Wi-Fi pops up and says, please enter your room number and password? Yeah. That's what's known as a captive portal. A captive portal makes you do something before it gets you onto the internet. So far, so good. I have my own one here, if I, it's called Evil Portal. And Evil Portal, what it allows me to do is create its own captive portal. Now, I'm gonna walk you through a scenario. I am sitting in a coffee shop, and I just scrape their login thingy. And I say, welcome to Tom's Coffee Shop. We've implemented a new system. Please put in your Facebook login, your, or please select one of the social providers here, and put in that username and password, and we'll log you in. We'll verify you are. We'll redirect you to that particular place. With me? People put in username and passwords, click submit. I just do a redirect to the page. Um, that like, for example, say it's Facebook, I redirect them to Facebook. Nine times out of 10, they're logged into Facebook already. So it looks like they've logged in. They're happy, I'm happy. I've stolen their credentials. Now, people will do anything for free Wi-Fi. If you think, now, the, the reason you guys are all connected to me right now is because of a, not a design flaw, but a usability enhancement. Everyone likes the fact that their phone connects to Wi-Fi, downloads their stuff, and oh, that's great, it's fantastic, it just did stuff. I don't have to worry about it. And what we're, what's happening here is, while well, this is loading, is that Apple's phones, if you've got an Apple iPhone, use this right now to delete all the old access points you can't actually delete, because the Apple's iPhone doesn't allow you to do that. The MacBook does, but the iPhone does not. It does not allow you to delete old access points that are not in range. So use this as an opportunity to, oh, Jesus. <laughs> Crystal, please. Okay. Um, and use this as an opportunity to delete all the old access points from your application, uh, from your phone, so that you do not get caught with this again. 
Your phone, what is happening here is my little box here is every time you send out a request saying, hi, is so-and-so Wi-Fi here? I go, yes. Do you want to connect to me? Yes. Done. They changed it now to so that what will happen is this. Instead of your phone actively pinging, it waits for a signal from the Wi-Fi to broadcast to say, I'm here. So we have a new thing called Pineapple Access Point and Beacon. And what this does is I harvest SSIDs. So if I look in here, and this loads up, I'll harvest SSIDs that people have actually pinged me for and add them to my broadcasting. So it, right now, your computer should be lit up with like a, uh, maybe up to a 500 different access points broadcasting from that little box. And all I'm doing here, Pine IP is not running, start now. But here is like the list of actual, if I control, if I scroll in a little bit, here are all the different SSIDs I've actually got. Sorry, oh, you can't see it, my bad. Uh, let's see if we do this. Can you see that? Yeah. So what I did is I went to wiggle.net, and what wiggle.net allows me to do is get the latest different Wi-Fi points from around the world. I can get the top 1,000 SSIDs if I want. It also, what I did here, was I went off and I took a screenshot of the Krakow Airport's different Wi-Fi points that we existed, and I added them in. Because guaranteed, most of the people that would be, uh, that would be speaking here today would have probably used the free Wi-Fi in, in, in an airport. And then I told it to broadcast as that. So I am now basically hitting you with different attack vectors. And what I'm trying to impress on you here a little bit is it is not just your code that's the only problem. This is how, um, for example, the Instagram side swipe works. If you're not familiar with what happens with the Instagram um, cookie uh, hijack, what you do is you use something like this. You intercept the um, authorization cookie, which is allowed to be sent in HTTP which means the authorization to access the application has been sent in plain text. And how difficult is it to recreate a cookie? <laughs> Let me see. Cookie manager, add new cookie. <laughs> cookie monster. Um, he was a clean guy before he got onto the cookies. Um, so what we're doing here is very simple. If we look here, this is, I'm, going to, I'm just going to skip through the XSS injection and I'm going to go into the cookie monster here. Cookies, like this, what they are doing is that I, what I have done is I've basically hijacked your cookie in plain text and recreated it and then I log in using your authorization. If you think about it, you store an auth code and if your application just checks, is the auth code valid? Log them in, do stuff, give them whatever they want. Then. What have I done? I've just stolen your credentials, but I don't even need your username and password. I've just logged in as you. And now I can reset your username and password if I want. Um, I will admit I've done this in a bad way. Um, I sent out a URL to an admin portal with the session ID cookie in the header, and everyone logged in as admin. And I went, oops. And that was the first time I ever learned of what was known as a session hijack. And I was back in 2001 for a government site. Still got, it's still up and I still had a job. <laughs> um, does everyone, is everyone familiar with what's known as an uh-oh second? Or an elastic second? An uh-oh second is when you do something, time freezes. Your stomach drops and just time goes and you go, uh-oh. And then it goes and you go, bollocks. And then continue on. That's an uh-oh second. It's where time just dilates and you just go slap back in. That was very much that, and that's an uh-oh second. So does, don't make your cookies unhappy. Make them very happy. Um, number one is an, or number two is an SQL injection attack. It's still one of the most uh, prevalent attacks out there. SQL injection, you'd think that developers would get this. It is like beginning basics of, one, of programming. Don't do SQL injection attacks. Don't get caught for SQL. And people go, yeah, 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 it's fine. So how many of you like escape special characters, the comma, things like that, all these type of things? Yeah, we, we, we assume the ORM will do it, but if we don't use like an, an object relational mo mopper, we may not even, it may not work. If we don't use something like Entity Framework, if we don't use an Hibernate or something like that, we might, if we roll our own, it's very easy to actually get caught by this. So SQL injection attacks are still the number one, are one of the number one attacks in the world right now. What is the number one problem? Not, not XSS is very high. It was just previous there. Users. <laughs> Users are the problem. 
because programmers don't think like users. Programmers think to the machine. Programmers do not think to the machine. They have an expression in Ireland, don't argue with a pig. The pig will get down and dirty and likes it. Okay? They have another one saying, like, don't argue with an idiot, they'll teach you with experience. You know? It's very simple. No matter how idiot proof you make something, someone will come along and break it. Because you'll go, why the hell? iPhones, break them again. Um, there was a hack for an iPhone going through the electricity channel. Where basically you plug in and say, we're, and, and, and force it to recognize as a, a electri uh, send electrical commands, and it would actually start um, uh, doing backups to, your phone, to the application. We start, you could actually just hack it that way. Have you seen what's known as a rubber ducky? Do you know what a USB pen is? USB stick, they're, they're going out of fashion these days. The USB stick, when you plug it in, what does it do? It identifies itself to Windows that I am running as a USB hard drive, okay? What a rubber ducky does, it identifies it as running as a keyboard. <laughs> but it's running a small little microprocessor and memory chip in the back, which I can write script for. Now, I'm hoping a couple of you are trying to figure out what's actually where this is going. But the idea of plugging something in and it just starts typing commands, a very fast, opens up, for example, command prompt, types in net user add, and adds an admin user, removes the um, fire, turns off firewall services, turns off this, and enables an admin share, and then it starts running FTP <coughs> services. Or starts basically running, an, installs an FTP service in the background and just has it to FTP all your data up somewhere in the background while you're not noticing. And it does this in three or four seconds. Have you seen what's known as Conboot? Conboot is a beautiful piece of kit. If for $15, you can buy a, recover, a, pass, or a system recovery disk. You plug it in, you turn on your PC, your PC boots up, it comes up with a login screen, you press enter, and it just logs you in. It does it for the Mac, it does it for Windows. Now what this is doing is it is intercepting, as the boot is loading and intercepts in memory, what the application is doing for login and just bypass and just says automatically one. Now, this concept is, for most people, absolutely terrifying, but the idea of, like, for example, I can walk into a corporate environment and pen test and just like, put in a USB and tell it to reboot, and I'll log in and I'll do stuff, and they'll be like, one in the wiser. Users and people are your enemy. <laughs> Kill all things. Okay. No matter how bad it seems, there are, there are people out there to help you. Go look at, there's like a lot of websites, there's some really good resources. If you haven't read uh, by Troy Hunt, um, he has an of top 10, please go download it. It's a fantastic piece of kit, it's very much on this. There is like the anti-access toolkit. You can use a safer web to go check your applications directly. He also has haveibeenpwns.com, so you can do little password breaches. Right, we've got some security guidelines. This is all going to be on the web. There's some image credits. It's my information. There's an opaque account because I'm being recorded and I don't like giving out my personal email unless I've met you. So, sorry about that. Um, you can get me on Twitter. You can use the uh, things. I'd like to thank Rafa and Mikel, who I have I'm immortalized in, I think it's a Lodikin bug. <laughs> So they thank them for bringing me over. The, um, I thought it was a very good likeness to do them, actually. Uh, um, if you are doing anything after this, the complimentary talks for this one, um, go and see Seb Rose's talk on testing, because this leads in directly. If you're not testing your application, putting in security tests will work. Also, go see uh, Casio's talk on the art of saying no. This is whereby someone is saying, we want to put this in, but it's not secure or whatever, and you want to push back on it. So those two talks will probably help you out on this. They're just complimentary to this. Any questions? So did you steal our passwords with SSL? Um, I've only stolen a couple, but I'm deleting the logs. I will show you I'm being deleted in my way. Um, uh, realistically, the SSL, if you're supporting HSTS, um, which is hyper, what's it called again? Sorry, I have to. I keep forgetting what HSTS is called. Where is it? Come on now, use it for this. Wi-Fi panel. HTTP strict transport security. Okay, this I'm, I'm going to show something here. Maybe it's not going to be good. Um, HSTS is supported by these browsers. Uh, sorry. 
implementations, browser support. HSTS is whereby I send, you're running HTTP and you want to be strict. In other words, if it comes over HTTP, you're going to bounce it straight back. HSTS is built into the browser, so it will not let you send it over HTTP. So there's an automatic HTTS. If, you've got, if you can enable HTTS in your application, do it. But unfortunately, Internet Explorer will not support them until after IE 11. So for the man who said to use Internet Explorer, no. But no, I did not see any of your credentials. Um, I'm fairly going to be very honest about that. I'm going to delete everything because it's not fair. I did not know I was going to be doing this. And it's nice to kind of just scare you a little bit and give you a little bit of Oh boy, like a bum. Any other questions? Uh, yes. Yeah. Sorry, you're like, uh, you go first. Okay, about the knowing versions you're running on. Yes. It's better to stick the one you think you are secure or enable auto update for everything. Is it better to stay to the one you're secure, that you know is secure, or think is secure? Um, the thinking is secure is bad, because you don't know. You have to. It, it, this is the problem with versioning in general. Like for example, stuff that comes up like the bash um, exploit is very, very new, and you have to patch it. So you're going. Realistically, what I would say is keep up to date and look at the um, SANS or uh, the vulnerability database and see if your application comes up in there. And um, just and try and keep up to date. Uh, Bash, is it about the uh, environment variables and running code that uh, are in, in a variable? Is it this? Uh, and the Bash, oh, I think the Shellshock, um, as far as I understand, it's like echo cat and it just sends in a command variable, which is then the thing doesn't escape, and then you can actually get it to run arbitrary commands, even though without running, like for example, because I'm sending it to the Bash shell. It's, it's new, right? It's, it's, it's very new, it's only released uh, yesterday. A, I just got a newsletter uh, from Slackware about this. Yeah, it's, it was, it's released yesterday. They patched it already, but you have to manually, like if you're running OS X, please go patch. Yes, the guy went, oh crap, Mac. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I see you. Please go patch your, um, look, uh, go and patch it. it just uh, download the update, it takes about two minutes and patch bash because it is very bad. Uh, because all I was, I, I didn't have time to write, but I really wanted to write a piece of code that where you would act, run DNS spoof on this, and it would access, and it would just pop up and run an arbitrary shell on your Mac, and then tell you to do stuff. I think I'm out of time. I'm out of time. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for your attention. Have a great day.